Well, good morning to you. It is Thursday, a throwback Thursday indeed. We're going to uh, be talking with Steve Bazden about a debate that actually happened uh, last weekend. And uh, just for those of you that are tuning in, just let you know what you're tuning into. Uh, this is the Preterist Power Hour. It is a ministry provided to you through the Power of Preterism Network, which you can learn more about at powerofpreterism.com. Uh, I'm Mike Miano. I'm pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church, director of the Power of Preterism Network, and it's my privilege to be here with you for our weekly session, this Preterist Power Hour. Edward, I want to go ahead and say good morning to you and offer time for you to introduce yourself and lead us in on a word of prayer, if you don't mind. Good morning. Uh, my name is Edward Howell. I'm a member of the Blue Point Bible Church, also a board member of the Power of Preterism Network. And it's an honor and privilege to have Steve Bazden on. That uh, let me just open us up in prayer because I don't want to get into my prayer. Okay, um, Heavenly Father, please go before us. Give us clarity of mind, thought, and proper focus. Thank you for having Steve Bazin on with us. Bless him. Give him a proper focus that he may present. You know what he has to say with uh, clarity that we may be able to glean from it and open up a discussion and discuss these matters that we may grow and develop and uh, also uh, develop fellowship with one another in discussing these matters as we grow in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, uh, we kind of let the cat out of the bag there. Our goal is to move in on discussion with Steve Bazden in regards to his recent debate with Steve Whitsett, and uh, I'm excited for that. I'm appreciative that uh, Steve has taken some time to join with us uh, in regards to this debate, which was titled Resurrection, one for the ages. And we had been actually letting people know announcements uh, each week since January, I believe, about the debate, keeping up with the changes and uh, some strange stuff that was happening uh, right before the debate was happening. Uh, so Edward, you were familiar with that. And of course, uh, Edward, you're familiar with Steve Bazden as we've had communication with him before. Uh, him and I had participated in dialogue. Uh, we've participated in conferences together. We've participated in debates uh, in regards to other topics. And two things I wanted to highlight at the outs uh, at the beginning here of our program, uh, and then I want to give you a moment to finish your thought that you were going to say there before uh, you prayed, Edward. If uh, you want to sort of uh, let us know some of your thoughts about you know uh, your influence from Steve Bazin, etc. Uh, but that being said, I wanted to just start out with two thoughts. Uh, the first being, and Edward, you know I've talked about this before: the difference of reading between reading and reading comprehension. Uh, there's people that can read and can tell you what the words on the page said. You know, that's that's reading. Uh, then there's people that can read and understand what they were reading and develop a dialogue about what they were reading and help you understand what they were reading. Uh, those are two categorically different things, and they need to be identified when you're listening to teachers, when you're reading through teachings. Uh, they're very important. Reading comprehension is so important. It's something we learned in grade school. It's something that we need to hold on to as adults, especially when it comes to reading through the Bible, understanding literary styles, understanding, you know, again, engaging in apologetics, if you will, having an answer for the hope that is in us. These are important things. Reading comprehension is important too. So uh, that being said, I wanted to highlight that. And uh, I'm sure maybe Steve might even have some thoughts in that regard that he'll share with us. But uh, I think that's so important. And I saw that as I viewed uh, this recent debate, uh, the, the need for that to be understood. And then the second thing, uh, is a quote from J.I. Packer that is constantly alluded to. J.I. Packer is a reformed teacher, and uh, it's a quote that is often brought up in preterist discussions and circles. Uh, I wanted to kind of paraphrase some of it here. Um, you can actually read the full quote and more quotes like it at preterismmatters.webs.com. Uh, here, this is the quote. We approach the scriptures with minds already formed by the mass of accepted opinions and viewpoints with which we have come into contact in both the church and the world. It is easy to be unaware that it has happened. It is hard to even begin to realize how profoundly tradition in this sense has molded us. But we are forbidden to become enslaved to human tradition, either secular or Christian, whether it be Catholic tradition, critical tradition, ecumenical tradition, whatever tradition. We may never assume the complete rightness of our own established ways of thought and practice and excuse ourselves the duty of testing and reforming them by the scriptures. So I say that because the two things that I appreciate about Steve Bazden, uh, you know, regardless to disagreement and, and strong disagreement in some very essential areas, uh, I'm sure he would agree with that. 
that being said, the two things I appreciate is that Steve has demonstrated reading comprehension, uh, which holds him accountable, and uh, which is a good thing, and it's a beautiful thing. And he also has demonstrated a spirit that is willing to be reformed by the scriptures. As uh, as I was noticing the websites that we have for the preterist community, we all have these free websites. That's why we have preterism.webs, preterism.wordpress. Uh, you know, That's because nobody's getting rich in the preterist movement, you know, uh, as progressive as not progressive is probably not the right word I want to use as advancing as preterism is, we know that it is still a minority view and that should encourage us and compel us, compel us to get out there, talk with more people, uh, help people understand what we're saying about fulfilled Bible prophecy, preterism, present truth, fulfilled eschatology, whatever phrase you want to use, uh, get out there and start talking with some people about the importance of having a good handle reading a comprehensive view of of us of eschatology you know that's what we call the power of preterism so uh, i want to say that that's my understanding of steve and edward i want to just give you a moment before we uh, welcome steve on the program to uh share any thoughts that you might have no i just look forward to learning from uh steve and uh enhancing what i already know amen because amen. he, he is on. one that you know that uh i believe has an understanding, like you said, of comprehension, and that can share the manifold wisdom of God, which I'm eager to learn. <laughs> That's right, amen. As we've been talking about, you and I, we listen to agree. You know, we, it doesn't mean we don't find disagreement and we don't mark out disagreement, but we listen to agree to enhance our understanding. And I think Steve is a great person to kind of lead us in on that conversation uh, in regards to preterism and the power of preterism. And uh, that being said, Steve, good morning to you, brother. Thank you for taking some time to, uh, out of your day to uh, join with us. And uh, I want to go ahead and let you uh, kind of lead some conversation with us. As you know, we gave you an outline there. We all have it. And uh, we're curious to hear some of your thoughts uh, in regards to the, uh, the debate. So good morning to you. Hey, good morning. How are you doing this morning, Michael and Edward and all that are tuning in listening? I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate... Um, your fight for the cause of all things being fulfilled. And we do have our disagreements, but that's not what this conversation this morning is uh, gonna be focused on. Yeah. And uh, we do, uh, one of the reasons, I'm gonna get this out there real quick. <clears throat> one of the reasons I'm so uh, staunch on continually trying to push all things being fulfilled in front of uh, quote unquote, the Christian environment is because it will cause you to rethink your entire Entire theology religiously. Amen. It will cause you to re examine everything you thought you once knew. It will cause you to re examine things you think you're learning now. It will cause you to re examine what you might even want or allow yourself to believe in the future. If you have a correct understanding, all things have already been fulfilled. You won't be worrying about the boogeyman coming tomorrow. Um, it, 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 it will help you to hone in so sharply. And what it is you thought you once believed that you may find yourself changing or even strengthening things in ways you never even saw possible before. So this is a very worthy endeavor that we have all chosen to pick up the sword with and take to the public because they don't even understand what they're missing when they're missing fulfilled eschatology. They, they can't they don't have a, a, a clue. It's like they're fumbling and bumbling around in the dark trying to find some light where when we've opened the door, you know, I, I believe that I've opened that door in my own personal life. And within a very short time, I've been able to expand my thoughts and my ideology and my understanding uh, thousands of times over where I could have never done it before without realized eschatology, without fulfillment. And so this is, this is really worthy. Amen. Amen. And I appreciate that. So uh, obviously our goal this morning is to talk about your recent debate with uh, Steve Whitsett titled Resurrection One for the Ages. I know it's available on YouTube, so we'll provide that link. Uh, we have a website, powerofpreterism.wordpress.com. That's our blog. If you visit powerofpreterism.com, it will take you to the blog easier way. Just plug in Power of Preterism to the Google machine, if you will, and that'll pop up a bunch of websites as well. Uh, that being said, we're going to write a blog that'll have the links for the debate, uh, a link for the debate that I had done with Steve Whitsett, which we'll actually talk about, I'm sure, later in the program, and uh, also uh, some other links that may come up during our conversation that would be a part of this conversation. So, uh, Steve, I'm curious to hear, uh, how did this debate come about? Uh, what was the, the beginnings of it, if you will? 
And uh, that'll obviously uh, lead us into a little bit of an opportunity to talk about your view on resurrection, uh, which we'll talk about a bit after. So yeah, how did the debate come about? Well, you know, I met Stephen Wetset on Facebook. Um, that's where I think probably all of us come into contact with each other at some point is through via uh, Facebook. And, you know, you you don't know a man by just typing back and forth on, on a keyboard, via a keyboard, really. And sometimes it's really hard to express yourself. So in the beginning, when I first met him, I tried to engage him with dialogue. I tried to engage him with, um, you know, um, reasonable approach to the scripture. And time and time again, he continued to disappoint me. I'm going to say it that way. And just absolute uh, rejection of things I thought were so profound, so objective, so reasonable, so harmonizing within the scripture that at some point in our discussions, I just thought the guy's not even worthy to talk with any longer. And, and that's not, that's not, on, that's not an, uh, a foreign concept to the Bible. Jesus in Matthew 7 would say, give that which uh, give not that which is holy unto the swine, uh, to the dogs, neither, neither cast you your pearls before the swine. And there's a time when we got to just, you know, wipe the dust off our feet with people and move on. And so that's sort of where I was with Witset. I would see his comments all over the place. And this is a dialogue over years, okay? Um, and I would see him talking with other people. And he continued to exhibit this exact same mentality of, I almost thought he wasn't even reading what I was responding with or what others were responding. It was just like he would just come back and say anything. Uh, is, you know, and in my mind, so, so many things were so outlandish that I had decided I wouldn't even respond to him any longer, even in writing. Well, as the years went by, um, some people started saying, uh, I'd like to see Stephen Wetset debate Steve Baisden. Then I said, it's not going to happen. I have no interest in debating this man. Uh, he's a man that in my, my mind and in my heart, I've already sort of said, I, I, I'm not even going to go there with this guy because it's not worthy. It's not worthwhile. It's a waste of my time. And then um, I said, he's a man that is not a pastor anywhere. He really, that I could see, had no influence with anyone anywhere. Um, just a guy, a, a lone wolf with a totally different ideology. I could never nail it down because it was so inconsistent. And I thought, it's just a waste of time. I said, I'm not going to engage in hours of debate and, and hours of preparation and, and funds that it takes to travel the distance, as you well know, Michael, to engage in these things. It, it's not cheap, especially in today's market society. And so, but Whitset came on uh, and he said in private message to me, I have a supporting congregation. Uh, over 300 people will be in attendance. They're all interested in this and the pastor of this denomination will actually be my moderator in the debate. And I said, okay, great. You, you have some influence with these people. These people have interest. They're going to attend. I said, can you assure me, can you assure me that they will support you in this, that they're going to be there and that I can rely on this information. Yes, I can. Okay, we made the plans. Well, from there, the whole thing started shifting. Uh, wasn't long after that. Um, all of a sudden, he sent out a new flyer. The original denomination that was supposedly supporting it had now gone away, and he had a different denomination, the Church of the Nazarene. And then I thought, well, okay, there probably isn't 300 people at the Church of the Nazarene in Fremont, Nebraska. I thought, yeah, if there's 30 people, I'll go. If there's 20 people, I'll go. So I, I, I sort of said, okay, I, you know, I didn't say anything. But then that they fell away. Now he's got it listed as being done at the family center. Well, now I'm thinking, what's going on here? You know, so I asked him and he kept saying details shortly coming, details shortly following, details are coming, you know. So I called the family center. I had to Google them. I, I found that they were, uh, it's not, it is a it is a facility at the Baptist Church in Fremont, Nebraska. I asked the secretary, I said, uh, my name is Steve Bayston. I'm coming from Michigan this weekend to engage in a conversation. And it's at your facility. I said, are you aware of it? And she said, yes, we're aware of that. I thought, okay, cool. But then I said, has it been advertised? Do you have many or several of your you know, parishioners that will be coming to the discussion? And she said, oh, no, we have nothing to do with that. We don't want anything to do with that. Uh, he just rented a room, basically, is what she said. I said, was your pastor even going to be going? And she said, I have no idea. If he's interested, he might. He probably won't. Uh, but if he's interested, he may. He may not. 
And I thought, oh, no, this is not cool, man. I, I, we're spending thousands of dollars. I got to travel almost 2,000 miles, uh, take all this time, take all this money, take all this effort to go there to meet him in a room where there may be two people, him and his wife, and, and maybe Sam Frost, maybe. And, and I, I, that's the whole point. Everything kept falling apart. And everything was, I couldn't trust anything he had given me. And then in the middle of this whole thing, he just changed the times. He just said, okay, we're going to start at 10 in the morning now. Well, my moderator had a flight coming into Omaha at 10 that morning because our original agreed upon uh, time was one o'clock. And so my moderator had plenty of time to fly in at 10 and be there by one. No problem. Well, now he changed the time beginning at 10. Well, we already had reservations coming in, not even landing till 10 in Omaha. And I, at that point, I just said, uh, and then after I called the Church of the Nazarene, where it was going to be hosted, they said, we did not advertise it. We don't even want this stuff around here. Uh, I don't know how or why this whole thing even developed and how we got put on a list. And the whole thing just, they smelled to high heaven, Michael, to put it shortly. Mm -hmm. And so my original thoughts were, I believe, correct. He's a man of very little to no influence. He's a man that's sort of all over the map. Um, he's a man that I have a hard time really being able to put in a solid care category, if I can say it that way. And so, but I, I gave him the courtesy. Um, I gave him the courtesy of saying, okay, I'll do it via the internet. Because just because I wanted to save face, to let people know I'm not afraid to engage with anyone at any time. I'm really not. But in order to travel all the way and spend all that money, it has to be justified. And I'm supposed to be a good steward of what God has blessed me with. And I'm not going to be frivolous with that. I want to be faithful in all manner of my Christian endeavors. So that's how the whole thing developed. And that's how it ended up being done via Zoom over the internet, where I was in Ludington. He was in uh, Fremont, Nebraska. Amen. Yeah, and I appreciate you sharing that. I, I kind of obviously knew some of the history. I know you have a video uh, that you had posted there uh, that I'll encourage people, you know, you could go ahead and look for Steve Baisden's YouTube page and you can see uh, the video about a broken covenant. And I thought that was a good, uh, a good video, a good explanation of some of the things that were going on. And uh, I believe Steve Whitsett, to be fair, I believe he has a video as well uh, explaining his side of the story. As they say, there's always two sides of the story or three for that matter. Right. <laughs> um, you know, so uh, you could go ahead and watch that. I haven't taken the uh, the time to uh, watch that at this point, but um, maybe I will just for uh, the fun of it. I'll get into that. I have my own thoughts, uh, as I believe I made you aware after the debate. And it's always good to learn some things after the debate or uh, that, that, you know, I had previously debated him. And I believe that he demonstrated himself to be, uh, I don't have a lot of good things to say. Um, and that was not only in debate, but also in leisure, uh, as we've mentioned, you know, you don't, as you mentioned, Steve, very well, uh, that you don't know a lot about somebody just off of the internet. And uh, when you meet somebody in person, it, it definitely sh shares some things with you. Um, uh, and even just the demeanor, uh, I think, is important uh, in person. You can see somebody's decorum and you can see their, you know, the way they respond to things, et cetera. I have, I have a question, quick question for you, Mike. Um, did you actually go out to Fremont, Nebraska to engage him or did he come to Long Island? How, how did your debate with him work? No, so the Blue Point Bible Church so graciously provided the funds to have him flown here and uh, put up here at a hotel, and uh, we wow. he came here to debate at uh, for the end times. And uh, I will get into this uh, as we talk a little bit further about what I think is proper debate planning and vetting. Uh, I think we we can all learn from these experiences and say maybe mark out some things for the future so that we don't see a redundancy. Uh, I appreciate that you mentioned. Uh, good stewardship, because I think uh, yeah, that's a beautiful principle that I want to return back to. Uh, obviously, okay. one of the things I think we're also going to need to consider, and we probably should just say it now, is a good stewardship of people's time. Uh, Absolutely. You know, uh, so uh, sometimes it's like, man, is this worth the, the effort? Um, you know, so I, and I appreciate that you've marked out some really good points already uh, that I think people need to consider as we talk about uh, debate, etc. Before I go a little bit further, though, uh, so here you are, you're, you're getting ready for this debate. Some people would say, okay, well, Steve, what do you believe about the resurrection that you believe is so affirmative that you need to debate a man like Steve Whitsett? So obviously that opens up for Steve, tell us a little bit. What is your view of the resurrection? Well, my view of the resurrection is far more simple than most people uh, make it out to be. Most people make it out to be 
you're you're lying in some physical earthly grave with you know six feet of dirt above you and you've been dead for a thousand years and all of a sudden god's going to reconstruct your physical body he's going to bring you through the physical dirt you're going to come up and then in a moment a twinkling of an eye you're going to be changed to something different and i used to also believe that um as a, as a christian years ago but as i continued to study my bible i found the premise of resurrection especially the resurrection of coming back to life with god and that's the key from genesis to revelation the whole book is about our spiritual being and our spiritual existence and our spiritual relationship with god Amen. sin will separate us from god we are dead to God, whereas in, in Isaiah 59 gives a wonderful explanation. He says, your sins have separated you from your God. He cannot see you. He will not hear you. His hand is too short that it cannot touch you, but your sins have separated you from him. It's like a father saying to his son today, oh, you're dead to me. I don't want anything else to do with you. And that's the idea. And so when we realize that when we sin, we die, the wages of sin is death, uh, Romans 6, 23, and then we start looking at other passages, Jesus talking to his disciples who are there physically alive with them. He said, you can pass from death to life. We can see Jesus and the Bible's not talking about physical life because they were already alive physically. We can see in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, where Paul said, all were dead. Since all were dead, Christ died for all. Well, all weren't dead physically or they could not have nailed him to the cross. And so when I started looking at resurrection, I'm thinking, now, wait a minute, hang on. Jesus come to bring life, but in order to have life, if they're dead, they have to resurrect from the dead into life. And so my, my idea now is a biblical scriptural idea of resurrection life, and that is I have risen from the dead from a, as a, from a spiritual standpoint. I'm no longer dead to God. I'm not separated from him. He will hear me now. He can see me now. I can see him now. I can hear him now through his words. I walk by faith and not by sight physically. And so as we look at these ideas, there's other things that come along with this resurrection. I was dead. I had to raise to life. Well, I, I, I believe the scripture teaches that I rose to life when I was born again. Romans chapter six, verses three through six. Uh, knowing that, that as many of us as have been baptized into Christ, we're baptized into his death. And we have risen to walk in newness of life being then in resurrection. Well, Jesus is the resurrection. Now, if I'm alive um, with Christ now, I was dead because of my sin. That means I have already risen to life. I'm in resurrection life right now. And if I'm alive with Christ right now, I don't need any future job coming in my future. Why do I need a future? What am I going to resurrect from? Am I going to resurrect from being with Christ to being with Christ? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But unfortunately, the people we deal with are as carnal as the Jews were in Jesus' day, and all they can see is physical kingdom, physical death, physical life, physical everything, and they make a mockery of the beautiful spiritual nature that we have within us that can be through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well said and succinct. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned something there that I, I want to, that'll lead us into our next point. Um, you, you know, as you went through the debate, I'm sure it became apparent uh, that, you know, there's so much contradiction in regards to what the futurist is saying in regards to our resurrection, because again, we know that they'll agree with us that Christ is the resurrection. Amen. Because Jesus said that uh, Jesus said that if you believe in me, you've passed from death to life. And as you rightly pointed out, I have a quote from you. Uh, if I'm alive now, what am I going to resurrect from in the future? So, you know, that point being said, you realize, and I'm sure you realize that Steve Whitset doesn't have, you know, a, a good hermeneutic. You know, he had mentioned hermeneutics there. He doesn't have a good understanding of what he's saying about resurrection. He doesn't know if he's putting the resurrection uh, for those that are that are believing in Jesus at the moment of their belief, or if he's putting it in AD 33, or if he's putting it. And I say that because one thing that I want to highlight as important in this study is that in the New Testament, for example, or throughout the whole Bible, there's different details happening in what we call resurrection texts that are being highlighted. Each of the texts aren't, you know, while they might be syllogistic and we can, you know, are synonymous with each other, uh, we need to understand what different points are being made in different places. For example, 1 Thessalonians 4 
is Excellent. not necessarily detailing the same point that first Corinthians chapter 15 is saying, while it might be talking about the same thing, resurrection of the dead and that experience of the coming of the Lord and what will happen, but there's different points being made in each of the texts. Philippians yes. 3, for example, or 2 Corinthians 3 through 5. There's a host of texts. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, Steve. I just did a, a presentation on the resurrection actually in Tennessee uh, last weekend. If you're interested, I'll send you a, a, a copy of the, the discussion and the outline I provided uh, to help people get a better handle on what the fulfilled you know, understanding of resurrection actually is in contrast to what is often you know, the, the confusion that I saw Steve Whitsett seem to have uh, with what is being said. So uh, that being said, I'm curious to hear your post-debate thoughts. So you went through this debate. What were some of the things that, as you came out of the debate, that you began to uh, realize about your view or the problems with the futurist view? You, you know, what are some of your, your post-debate thoughts for that matter? Well, even during the debate, um, what you start doing is you start thinking, uh, at least in my experience with this whole thing, I thought, Yep, exactly what I expected. Yep, uh, you know, you try to lay out passages that are, uh, and one of the hermeneutical principles that I laid out is every passage of the Bible must harmonize. Every passage from Genesis to Revelation, we always talk about immediate context, immediate context, and we pull one verse out of a chapter right out of its immediate context, or we'll say, here's the immediate context. We'll look two verses above, two verses below, and we say we have the immediate context, and we, tow off, we totally blow off the remote context. Hmm. All the Bible must harmonize. And when I saw Stephen Whitsett, for example, you gave 1 Thessalonians 4 uh, as an example. Let me use that real quick. He used 1 Thessalonians 4 saying that there is different resurrections. There's a resurrection of the just at one point. But then he says there's a resurrection of the unjust at another point, which is in our future. Now, he used 1 Thessalonians 4. We, we which are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord. And they which are dead should be caught up first with us. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, right? But then in the debate just prior to that, he said that took place at AD 33 on Pentecost. Hmm. He said that's when they came out of Hades. But Paul said when he wrote that they had, they had not yet come out of Hades. That's the just. And he totally contradicted himself. Hmm. And it's totally convoluted. So right in the middle of things and in immediately following, I thought, well, here we go again dealing with people who just will not be what they claim to be. And there's so many ways we could take what he has said and illustrate from an honest perspective how it's contradicting. Jesus is not contradicting Paul. In fact, Paul just said, I say this to you by means of the words of the Lord. He said, let me tell you what Jesus said about this. But Whitsett's doctrine has them contradicting. And that's the premise of any futurist dialogue or ideology they're going to run into this brick wall where they're constantly um, contradicting themselves. And so my post thought ideas was, number one, glad I didn't go to Nebraska and spend all that money and time. <laughs> number two, uh, I'm saddened that uh, he is as close minded as he is. That really bothers me. It saddens me. And number three, I'm sorry for the people who he may be having some kind of influence with who has some trust in what this guy is saying because like you had said before he has scriptural memorization but he cannot properly comprehend uh what's going on in those passages and he just shoots from the hip every which direction at the moment whatever comes up he shoots he thinks he gives a viable answer but if we're careful and we're listening carefully we'll see how he's contradiction contradicting himself and other passages. So that's my, my immediate post thoughts after and even during the debate. Right on. You know, and I have to say, uh, now, Edward, I want to give you a moment. I know you had said that you haven't taken the time yet to go through the debate, but I am going to give you a moment here to jump in and maybe share some thoughts uh, as to what we've been talking about here. Uh, but I did want to say this. Uh, so I'm currently going through the debate for my second time. I jumped in maybe halfway uh, the, for when you guys were live there on Zoom. And now I'm currently going through the YouTube video. I'm about a half, I think I have a half hour left. And uh, I've noticed some things right away. You know, uh, one thing that's the two things, if I may, that really stood out to me was if you go to the hour two of num minute 18, hour two, minute 18, and you listen to what he says, Steve, this is Steve Whitsett's doctrine. Sorry, the fullness of the deity does not dwell in the church. You can go and yes. listen to him say that. He said wow. that. And I know, it's crazy. That, 
I, again, it gave, it gave me the chills to say it right now. Uh, you, you know, that's a problem. That's a problem. And, and that's minute, hour two, minute 18. I actually have the seconds. It's second 24, if you really dive in on it. Uh, folks, read Ephesians chapter one and read Ephesians chapter, read chapters one through three. Read that text. And when you read that, what Paul says right there in Ephesians 1 is the power that resurrected Jesus from the dead dwells in the church. He is the head. The church is the body. And that, again, it dwells in the church. To hear a man that claims to be a Christian say something like that baffled me. I, I said that is that needs to be called out. That's a problem right there. Uh, and then another thing that he said, I don't have the minute down, the hour, the moment, like the actual time down. I will have it if you ask me at a later time. This is something I want to encourage people to be doing in regards to these debates. One way that these debates become healthy and that we can actually use them is by taking the time to go through and mark out certain things at certain points. And I'm, I'm working on a study of doing that, putting the time and effort in to really go through and mark out the problems that we see in all of these debates. Uh, one thing I'll mention was uh, I'm pretty sure during the debate, and Steve, you might have remembered this as well, uh, Steve Witset said, that the coming of the Lord, talking about the coming of the Lord, that he's expecting and waiting for, has nothing to do with Jesus coming in the clouds, has nothing to do with him coming with angels, has nothing, he said, because all of that happened in AD 70. So he, he's trying to apply, and, and again, this is his view. He claims it's called middleism. And what he's trying to teach is that some of this stuff will apply in AD 70. So I agree with the preterist there, and he, he mentioned this right in his opening. And then what he'll do is he'll say, but there's other texts, and then he'll list them, and say that they're in the future. But then if you listen, as you're rightly pointing out, he has them all over the place. You, you don't know what's happening, where, there's no, no clear thought. And he said that the coming that he's waiting for is not the coming in the clouds. And I, I think that needs to be clarified for some people because there's a lot of folks out there with this partial preterist view that don't realize the contradictions going on. So you're, wait a minute, you're, you're waiting for the coming of the Lord that's mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 4 but he's not going to come in the clouds. You're waiting for the coming that happened in Acts chapter one, just like he left, but he's not going to come in the clouds. I'm like, wait a minute here. Something is very wrong with this view. Uh, and I hope people are catching it. I'll call out the, the hour and the minute uh, in a couple of days as I continue my review. Uh, these things are very problematic uh, and need to be kind of highlighted. So I'm not sure, uh, Steve, if you want to respond to that. And Edward, uh, please jump in after Steve and uh, let us know some of your thoughts as we go through our discussion. Yeah, I did catch, uh, especially the blunder of um, the fullness of, of Christ does not dwell in the church. Uh, and he, he was using, let, let me give you the passage he used for that. He used Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. And wow. let me show you the problem. Let me show you the, the, the major blunder problem that the carnal physical futurists have with this. In mm. Colossians 2, 9, it says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, they see that word bodily, and he automatically says, see, that's a physical body. That's exactly what he said. Mm -hmm. It says bodily, based and doesn't believe bodily. Now, wait a minute. Hang on here. Just because it's not a physical body doesn't mean it's a body. Ask General Motors if they have a corporate body. Mm -hmm. Okay? And they'll say, oh, absolutely. In fact, there's only – then, so I, I, I said it, I think, in passing – but I said, how many bodies does Jesus have? Now, the Bible says he has one body. And I cited several uh, passages, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Ephesians uh, 4, verse 4. Um, but in, right in Colossians chapter 1, now he said, he cites Colossians 2 and says that in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He says that's physical. But in Colossians 1, 18, the text says, and he is the head of the body of the church. Amen. who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence amen and that is exactly ephesians 1 23 as michael has pointed out so the body here is the church body not a physical body and we can't even dwell in jesus physical body it's not here <laughs> and i and i said these things and and, and it just it, your mind wants to explode because they just keep saying no, 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 no. And they won't even listen. They want it. this comprehension. It's either a comprehension problem or a hard heart. I, I don't know. It's the only thing I can think of. What, what do you think, Edward? Well, I, I, my, my, my question is, does he uh, network with anyone? Does he have 
any giants that he stand on the shoulders of? Does he get information from, you know, um, um, reputable uh, <laughs> preterists or, you know, or I don't know where he gets his information. Is he one that just does his own study and, and he's his own theologian or, you know, is he a rogue individual or, you know, where is he coming from? Yeah, well, if I may jump in there and say something, Steve. So uh, as I've had to listen to Steve Witt said, he actually has a blog that he wrote against me where he says he claims that I replace the resurrection. Um, that, uh, you, you know, yeah, there's a, if you do the Google search, you put in Witt set Miano, it'll pop right up. Um, you know, he, uh, he has, who he learns from is the church fathers. And Edward, the reason I bring this up is because you're doing this grueling work with me uh, in our Saturday Bible study here, where what we did was we're going by generation. So we started with the generation of Christ, 30 to 70. Uh, we dealt with that generation, the writings that were written during that generation. And what we're doing is we're following this path of church history. And as you know, Edward, you know, you get into writings that the church fathers, you know, brought up Ignatius and a lot of these guys, Polycarp, very, I'm appreciative of their stance and I'm appreciative of their, their role in the early church. That's great. But they contradict themselves. They begin to be all over the place, the church fathers. So if you do the work, you realize that there's not this unanimous view in the early church, nor is there today. So if you keep hearing Steve Whitsett during the debate say this, this is what we say. I didn't have, I had no idea who the we was the entire time. I didn't know if he was talking about Steve and him, uh, if he was talking about all the Christians that he disagrees with, uh, all the Christians he agrees with. I, I'm like, I don't know who this man's learning from. So Edward, I appreciate that you brought that up. I wanted to jump in there. And again, if you listen to his, his teachings in, in the debates, you'll notice the we, you'll notice in my debate with him, he kept bringing up the church fathers. You'll notice in this writing he wrote against me, he alludes to the quotes from the church fathers. Uh, and I do want to say one thing. Uh, I, I try to do the work of going back and reviewing these debates. And uh, more recently on a, a road trip I was on, I had the opportunity to go back and listen to some of the debates that I've done in the past. And being that Sam Frost was the moderator there, I've debated Sam Frost. And something that I think needs to be highlighted at this very moment uh, is that when we say the church fathers, right, what I, I, I don't necessarily, that's a sort of a misnomer, if you will. Um, these were men in the early church, uh, you know, in, in the, the early days of the Christian community. Uh, they, I don't give them any special inspiration that I wouldn't give to anyone on this uh, call here. Uh, so, you know, I think that needs to be clarified. They didn't have some special unction because they were living 2000 years ago or something, you, you know. So that being said, um, I can say in one sense that I agree with a man that he did some great things and beautiful things. And he says some very right things as I'm saying about Steve Bazden today. But then I can also say, I disagree with that man. And I think that he says some things that I don't agree with uh, that, you know, I would challenge and I, I might go up against. And I say that because Sam Frost has said that that's me speaking out of both sides of my mouth. That's actually called being, being, you know, studious and listening well and, and learning where you can agree and where you can disagree. I do that with the church fathers as much as I do that with any teaching today. And I think it's important to impress that upon folks to do that work of listening where you can agree. And yes, you need to mark out disagreement, it's healthy. And there's areas where it lends to further study. So uh, Steve, I don't know if you had something you wanted to mention there about uh, where you think Steve Whitsett is learning from and uh, his, his mentors to kind of respond to Edward's uh, beginning thought there. Well, in response to Edward's thought is I think he's uh, I just think he's sort of rogue in that he's shooting from the hip. He thinks he's a Bible scholar. He really is arrogant, in my opinion, about how he approaches what he believes. And he's totally isolated by himself. I don't even think him and Sam Frost agree on the resurrection and these other things. Um, but he's, he's he's rogue and he's on his own. And one of the things that keeps coming back to my mind is Romans 3, 4. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Yeah. I don't care if every man on planet Earth is saying one thing. If that contradicts anything in the word of God, everybody's wrong. God's still right. That's right. That's right. So, um, you know, I, that's where I want to always land. And, and, I, and when I land there, I feel like I'm on solid ground. Amen. You know, I noticed Edward had to go, but uh, I do want to say when I first was you know, came to understand Christian thought. Uh, one of the things the man that had, you know, was speaking to me at that time, what he, he said to me was, um, make it your business not to agree with man, but to find yourself in agreement with God. And uh, that, that has always been my 
uh, or in, he, I think he even went on to say in agreement with the scriptures. Uh, and I would, I would make that my case. You know, that's what I think we should do. And I think that agrees with what you just mentioned there, Steve. Um, you know, so what I wanted to do was bring our conversation uh, toward, I appreciate Edward's thought there. Edward had a run. Uh, I meant to give him a little bit of time before 1140, just didn't realize. Uh, however, um, there's so much to say, Steve, you know, I have to mention that there really is. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, moving ahead. We talked about being good stewards. And I, I think uh, a part and parcel of our stewardship uh, is, is going to be, uh, obviously, as you mentioned, your money and your effort. So let's praise God that you didn't have to go all the way over to Nebraska to do this. I was actually baffled that it was going to happen. I was like, this is, I didn't, it, you know, if you go back to January, you'll, you'll hear some podcasts where I mentioned, I don't think it will happen. And I even, I have a saved screenshot where I recommended it for it not to happen uh, because I think that there's some uh, problems with, you, you know, re-debating somebody that's been shown to be sort of, uh, that way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and kind of all over the place. So you saved your money, you saved your effort. And I think we, you, as you mentioned before, you mentioned it quite well, was you realized post debate that, you know, you, you want to be a better steward of time and effort and people's time. Uh, the problem, I guess that I wanted to highlight is that when I want to encourage people to do a bit more, uh, you know, what is it a research and development, you know, ask yourself when you're getting into these debates, Google their name, Google, you know, uh, wit set preterism. And if you do, you know, things should come up where this man's done the debate before. And I'm saying that for further efforts, you know, I want people to uh, consider these things because I've seen this time and time again, where uh, people have done debates. And again, Steve, I'm not saying this necessarily about your debate, because I think you, you explained very well for us. And I appreciate that why you entered in on this debate. And I think there was background, but again, I'm, I know you've seen where people in a rush to do a debate, find themselves. And I'm speaking, preaching to myself, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. find yourself doing a debate with someone where, you didn't do the appropriate background, you, you know, look, look into who this person was, if I may, uh, you know, and I don't mean this to be disparaging, but I mean this to be clear. Steve Whitsett came to a, a conference here at the Blue Point Bible Church on preterism, and he was going to debate me there at the conference. He did not attend any of the speeches that were going on at the conference. And that's right. problematic. That's, that's, that's something that needs to be marked out. Uh, he had no desire to hear what we're saying or to understand what we're saying. And then came into the debate and then realized my posture in the debate. You can see this on YouTube. Uh, realized my posture in the debate was kind of on, you know, attack mode, if you will, uh, you know, to kind of de demonstrate the problem. And then he began to want to give me accolades and hug me. So, you, you know, I, I think if you watch that debate, you kind of see right there back in 2016, oof, this guy, you know, he, he's not healthy. There's something not healthy about his view. He doesn't realize the, the contradictions of the things he's saying. And uh, one thing I did want to say on that note, and I'm sure I'll let you respond to that in a minute. I did want to say this, though. Uh, you highlighted a very important thing, and I appreciate that you've brought it up, the supporting congregations. I think that having that is, is so important. And I'm yes. sad to hear that he, let's call it what it was, he lied. Uh, you know, uh, he lied that there was going to be this these people, and there weren't. Uh, you know, I, I know that for some people that seems harsh, but that's what it is. And, you know, we the reason why we do that is, as you noted, uh, it holds people accountable. Uh, you know, I don't care if it's five people. If you have five people gathered around you that you're teaching and preaching and leading in an assembly, I'll call that a congregation. And I'll say that that's a worthy group to come and talk to the minds and the hearts that are there. So, right you know, but at the same time, you know, that's in contrast to what you marked out as rogue. You know, these people that actually have nobody listening to them, uh, you, you know, maybe not even the people that they rub elbows with all day, you, you know, that, that to that extent. And that should be problematic. Yes. Now, let me let me let that is that is um, proof that illustrates my understanding, my belief that he is rogue mm -hmm. because he doesn't have a congregation that supports none. Zero zip zilch, not a nowhere, nobody. Um. He finds Sam Frost, who is also, I believe, a renegade and rogue in many, many ways. He wants to claim his hierarchy in some institutional uh, religion. But at the same time, uh, when you get down to the nuts and bolts of it, that's why he's not higher up in that in that institution that he's a part of. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the proof is in the pudding. The man is rogue. The man is individual. And the proof, we can illustrate that by him not being able to provide a supporting congregation. And by supporting, 
You know, I mean, somebody who's got his back, who stands with him, who supports him financially, who supports him mentally, who's there in a solidarity, showing their consistent views together with each other, supporting it uh, collectively in every way possible. Um, and I want to illustrate this, Mike, if you don't mind, with you and I. You and I also had a debate on soteriology. And you and I, I came to Long Island, New York. You came to Ludington, Michigan. And it wasn't your first time you come to, uh, to Ludington. You, you'd been to Ludington several years prior. But real quick, the dialogue that you and I had, the, discuss, the debate that you and I had, um, I had confidence that you were indeed coming to Ludington and that when I got to Long Island, I would find your supporting congregation there and, um, and that things were the way we had described them to be. And there was, a, there was a level of confidence that I had that this thing was going to take place in a good manner of the way we both promised each other. Mm -hmm. And I did not ever have that with Stephen Whitsett. And I just want you real quick, would you agree with my assessment of you, your exchange with me in, in debate? Amen. Absolutely. I would. I, I would say that uh, part of the debates, we go into this knowing we disagree. And if Edward was here, he would appreciate this because one thing I love that Edward talks about a lot is the benefit of the debate is not necessarily for the debate, the, the debaters, right? Yes. We know we disagree. Right. We've done dialogue. We've talked. Uh, what we're doing is we're coming together to give a good demonstration and hopefully exhort each other, which I believe, you know, during our debate, we did that toward each other uh, to sort of challenge each other in that regard, but also to the benefit of the hearers, you, you know, yes. so, you know, what I think we demonstrated was good manners, as you highlighted there, and also a good disagreement where you can now come out of that debate. I know I did saying, I know I can mark down for you why I disagree. I, I can mark down for you. You know, that's the benefit of these debates. One, one, of, one of the major things um, that motivates me, okay, is this. When you came together to debate me on soteriology, uh, salvation, I knew there were multitudes of people believing exactly what you believe, how salvation is achieved. Right. At the exact same to token, you know there are multitudes of people that believe uh, the same as I do and how salvation comes. Mm -hmm. And so when you came together to debate me, Mike, you were representing a collective of a belief. I was representing a collective of a belief. Which set represents himself. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to hold that accountable. You know, and again, I do want to say thank you to uh, those at Ludington. You know, I regularly think back, you know, to the luncheon and even there we were able to sit around tables and have discussion and disagreement. And some folks even shook my hand in disagreement and, and yeah. just saying, you know, this is this. And that's the way. And I hope that you experience the same here at Blue Point, where we can say, you know, it can be a, a sharp disagreement, you know, but at the right. same time, we have this foundation of you know, I'm coming to the table with an actual view. I, I, I you know, it, there might be strong disagreement in the way that we're putting together the view, but there's people holding me accountable to the things I'm saying. Exactly, exactly. And I, and I would say that that demonstrates true love, right? True sure. love uh, will actually appreciate the debate and the disagreements for what they are trying to accomplish. It, it's not, yeah. we're not debating to beat each other up. We're debating to try to come together. And so there has to be this, um, this level of respect and this level of confidence in each other that we're bringing forth um, a, a proper Christian character, at least on the onset and at the outset of these things. And we're going to exhibit this love toward one another and trying to uh, find a, a ground where we can come together on that we disagree with. Amen. Amen. And again, I know more recently you talked about it on one of your programs where you highlighted other details of good debate, you know, where we get into sort of the uh, what's that Roberts rules of orders, uh, you know, rules of order there where, you know, the particulars of what a debate might look like a good proposition, understanding what an affirmative is, understanding the difference between an affirmative and a negative, uh, you know, and then even getting a bit more, you know, not doing disparaging remarks toward the person, but staying on topic to what you're talking about. These are all things uh, that need to be considered when we're, we're putting together these debates. And, you know, I, I think that I know I use a little bit of uh, freedom there to kind of play around with the idea, because let's face it, I think God speaks to people in ways they understand, you know, in, in the context of scripture, he dealt with people that, according to their understanding of the culture. And I think it's important for us in some regard 
when we're doing these debates to think, okay, well, Robert's Rules of Order was written in a certain context as well uh, that, you know, we, maybe we need to be a bit more free with and say, you know, all right, take that out, maybe replace that with this because of the people that are listening. You, you know, uh, I even think, you know, the difference between doing a Bible study online and doing a podcast, we're much more casual, having conversation, exactly. where, you know, you, you do a Bible study, you hopefully you're a bit more, uh, you, you know, in order and in, you know, on target. So I think these are things that just need to be brought up to understand what the goal of a debate is, you know, what we're doing when we come to the table. If you want to have a conversation with me, don't tell me, you know, and ask me questions. Don't tell me we're going to do a debate. You know, let's do that. Let's call it that, uh, you know, dialogue and conversation. Uh, so uh, just I think that's important because I've seen people come to the debate table. Matter of fact, you know, in, during your debate, I was baffled at one point where Steve's supposed to be giving his view or I think even maybe giving a sort of rebuttal to your view. And he stops midway and he says, uh, did I answer your questions? You know, uh, Steve, you can answer me, you know, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. Now you're confusing me. I'm trying to follow your logic. I'm trying to hear you and you're you're going out of order. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, if you want to do that, there's a time and a place for Q&A. &A. And right. Right. so, yeah, just, you know, again, some things that I hope uh, I'm, I'm going to create a little bit of an outline uh, going through some of these things uh, that, you know, and I'm hoping we might all contribute to building upon what good debate vet, vetting might be. You know, that way, yes. you know, we should lean on each other. Uh, you don't know this, Steve, but maybe you do. I, uh, I regularly one of my grumbles against the, the preterist community, if you will, is our lack of networking. You know, and I had, as I mentioned, since April had been sharing your your debate because I believe it's part of the power of preterism uh, that, you know, and, and seeing actually looking forward to a conversation like this where we could see the problems with the debates. We could see the, the, the quality, you know, the good quality and hopefully aim for healthy quality in our debates that we move forward in. So um, that being said, I want to give you a moment to have some closing thoughts or uh, you'd let me know, Steve, what do you think? Should I unmute some folks and let them share a thought or two uh, and then give you a moment to share some closing thoughts? Yeah, that's up to you. Uh, as long as my internet holds up, I, I'm, I'm good here at least for a little while longer. Um, I do want to share just, a, uh, if you don't mind, a couple of quick thoughts, if that's okay. Please go ahead. Um, one of my thoughts was um, I wanted to know if all were sinners. Now, Romans 3, 23 says, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And I asked Whitset, are all sinners? And the reason I asked that is because that's very, very, very relevant to God's judgment. If I can say, if God can say, all have sinned, then that means God's judgment must have come. He's judged already that people have become sinners. His judgment must have come. If I can say all of, all of sinned, then that means his judgment must have, uh, have already come. Now, his judgment comes by means of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul in Romans chapter 2 says that men will be judged by my gospel. Jesus said, the words I've spoken, the same shall judge you, John 12, 48. The standard of judgment is the gospel, the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Now, if all have sinned, that means the judgment has come. And the judgment has determined all have sinned. Now, sin is transgression of God's law, Romans 3, 4. So transgress God's law, that means God's new law must have come if we've sinned under Christianity. That means God's judgment must have come. Now, I asked Winsett if the judgment and the resurrection are constituent elements. Do they happen at the same time? Because if he says all have sinned, then by virtue of implication, the, gospel, uh, the judgments come. If the judgments come, that means the resurrection, if it's a constituent element of that, has come as well. And the resurrection is eternal. Nowhere in the Bible does it say second resurrection, third resurrection, fourth. Nowhere does it say final resurrection. Jesus is the resurrection. Amen. We get it. And we, everybody has access to the resurrection eternally. There's no end to the increase, Isaiah 9. And he never would deal with that forthrightly. And that was, uh, that was my main thrust that I wanted to get out. And I thank you for allowing me that opportunity this morning. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. And I appreciate that your point there. I absolutely agree. Uh, I'm going ahead and unmuting some mics. And uh, if anybody wants to jump in, we got Richard, we have Zach, and we have Vicki with us here live in our session. That does give me opportunity, of course, uh, as they're possibly unmuting, to encourage those of you that might be listening, if you'd like to join with us, 
Uh, we do this 11 a.m. Monday through Friday. Matter of fact, tomorrow night, we're doing it at 7 p.m., uh, not at 11 a.m. Uh, we're going to have Jonathan Buttrey on the program, and our goal is uh, to encourage you to be a part of our session. You can Zoom in. You can call in. Uh, you can watch, of course, as many of you already are watching through Facebook Live, uh, and of course, watch this video as it gets uploaded to YouTube. So uh, those are the different ways, but we encourage you to be a part of our discussion and maybe mention some thoughts. Richard, I see you're unmuted. I want to give you a moment to go ahead and share some thoughts. Yeah, good morning. Hi, uh, Hi, Hi morning, everybody. Hi, Hi, everybody. Hi, 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 Hi. Richard, go ahead, brother, and I'm going to unmute Vicky here in a moment. Okay. Um, uh, uh, gee, I, I almost forgot what I was going to say now. Uh, Steve, you are you in a survival bunker there? It looks like you're, you're a survivalist. <laughs> well, yeah. Let, let me explain that real quick. Uh, my 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 daughter and her five children are here visiting with us this week, and uh, they're all upstairs. <laughs> and it is mayhem. I mean, all the kids are yelling and they're at grandma and grandpa's and there's no way I could have done this upstairs. So I came downstairs in my private little room and this is just a little storage room that we have for a few extras. Yes. All right. Um, I just wanted to uh, second what Mike was saying about the whole wit set argument can be eliminated with proper vetting. You know, um, he gave all kinds of warnings, you know, and, and, and you gave him the benefit of the doubt, and I really give you credit for that uh, because of the amount of time and aggravation that was involved. But uh, it's just proper vetting. And I, I think a little bit of vetting will tell you whether a person is just serious, a lone, you know, a lone wolf or ranger like he is, or, right. uh, or they just don't have, don't have basic logic skills, you know, to, to understand reading comprehension, you know. Uh, I remember that uh, I that debate with uh, Mike Miano and uh, and Mr. White said, and I, I remember thinking how sad it was. I mean, I almost <laughs> I almost felt bad for Mike because I'm saying he couldn't have planned this, you know, <laughs> to be to be so uh, you know such a crash landing. You know? <laughs> wow. I mean, I I remember the, the the hug, you know, the whole hug thing, and yeah. I remember saying, Gee, you know, it's like there's just a strangeness to this whole thing. <laughs> um did you probably didn't expect um and then you know when when you debated sam frost i mean you were you were in debate form and sam frost is in uh debate in charismatic form you mm -hmm. know where he he's there to debate and perform yeah. uh and and he does it very well i have to say he really does it very well i appreciate good oratory skills and I, he's got them you know <laughs> you may not agree with him but he can entertain you uh, while he's talking about this stuff, whereas many times uh, people like us might be a little more boring because we're, we're just quoting verses. We're not flourishing them, you know, uh, the way he can. So anyhow, uh, great to Steve. I, I really appreciate the effort you made with him. Um, I, I, I hope that uh, we in the British community uh, have no more debates with Stephen White said <laughs> so that 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 can be just, you know, the, the door can be shut on that one, I hope. Um, yeah. We've had other people come through these groups. I won't mention a name, but there was one in particular that was trying to set up debates with people and even set one up uh, with with uh, Don. And, um, you know, I, I had a little conversation with Don just to try to talk him out of it. And I think yeah. he saw what I was saying and he, he backed out. But, um, you know, just because they're on Facebook and they're debating scripture doesn't necessarily mean that they're wise or knowledgeable. And that, that, that could even be spoken of, you know, individually as each of us, because we've, we've all been wrong at one point, you know, we've all been wrong. We're yeah. all going to be wrong on something down the road. Uh, my prayer every day is God, show me my blind spots, you know, because we all got them. We all got, we all have them. And I'm always amazed. And I've, I've said this before, and I'll, I'll stop then. Um, that's, Sometimes somebody can have a point of scripture so crystal clear that we all learn from it. And we may disagree with them on a whole bunch of other things and understand. We'll say, how can't they, see? if they can see this one thing so clear, how come they can't see this other thing? I've you know? done that a thousand times. Yeah, yeah. you know, and, and, and whenever I see that happen with me, and I'm saying, I'm thinking that about somebody else, I'm saying, oh my God, you know, what are my blind spots? You know, 
And right. is this person is this person pointing one out to me that I just don't want to see or I'm not ready to see? Uh, but uh, it, it doesn't cripple me. But it just it's part of my thought process, you know, uh, because I've made doctrinal shifts in my life. Right. There were times that you think you know truth. And, you know, I mean, this whole bunch of us thought we knew truth and, and we just didn't know what we were talking about. You know, we would just believe in other people or jumping to conclusions or whatever it is that we do uh, to maintain our immaturity, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's all I want to say. It's great to meet you both. I, I feel as uh, I would be when I see two people agreeing like, you, you know, you two guys are doing. On, on you know finding uh, areas of agreement, and you tell me that you have areas of disagreement. You don't understand what that does to me because I want to say stop the discussion. I want to hear where you two disagree because <laughs> that's where I want to go. You know because let's see if we can't reach more agreement. You know, you know? that's yeah. I get bored with always agreeing. You know, so whenever you tell me that you you know you fortunately I I can control myself on the keyboards, but sometimes <laughs> I like to butt right in and say stop right there. Let's fight this one out right here, you know. Um, we're not, we're not like Joe Olstein and Billy Graham. We're going to have our disagreements. <laughs> all right, that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, again, we, we've done public debates, so people can go back and watch that. There's a YouTube video. I'll make that available. Uh, we, we've marked out some disagreements, and there's probably plenty of others. You know, there's nuances to what we debated that needed to be debated. So, you know, and that's one of the things I appreciate and I had said about to Steve uh, when I left Ludington was due to our good mannerism with each other and our fairness, hopefully we can keep a door open to further dialogue and discussions right. and disagreements. Um, right. You know, so um, Vicky, I know Vicky hadn't wanted to uh, join in here. I'm going to go ahead and unmute her. And uh, Vicky, we're interested to hear what your thoughts are. And I want to thank, of course, those of you that are tuned in online. I appreciate that you're uh, continuing to be a part of our discussion and watching our discussion this morning. I'm I'm still showing Vicky's muted there, uh, Mike. Yeah, I'm, I'm. There we go. All right, Vicky, go ahead. You're unmuted. Mike. No, no, you unmuted her or muted her back again, real quick. Yeah, I saw. I'm just gonna click it once and leave it alone. It's sending her the invite. She has to unmute it on her end. Oh, I see. I gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Vicky. <laughs> Sometimes Vicky tunes in on the road, so it might be uh, for her to uh, need to pull over and unmute. I don't want to hit it again, Vicky. It's uh, ready for you to unmute, so please go ahead. There you are. We got gotcha. you. Gotcha. Good morning. Uh, this question is for uh, Brother Basin. Okay. Hebrew 11, 39 to 40. Can you explain it? I think there are a few uh, doctrinal principles in this verse. Help me out, Mike. Did you catch what she was asking? Yes. So in Hebrews 11, 39 through 40, that's one of the texts we have a lot of discussion about, Vicki and I. Uh, it's the text where at the end of the, the hall of faith, so to speak, uh, you read that text there where it says they did not receive uh, what was hoped for, uh, which, again, I think is reflected in our discussion this morning. Uh, they did not receive what was hoped for until, you know, to paraphrase, until us, the church, right? That's their writing there to the Hebrew Christians. So uh, they did not receive it until that time of fullness where the church was receiving the gospel as well. Uh, but again, yeah. I think I'm curious to hear your thoughts in regards to that text. You know, my mind immediately goes to Colossians 1. Um, and I know you're familiar with that, Mike, but in Colossians chapter one, that Paul said it a little bit differently there. And um, let me let me pull that up. Colossians chapter one, verse 23. I want you to notice what Paul says here. He said, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, which we uh, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, now watch verse 24 carefully, who now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up that which is behind in the afflictions of Christ. So Paul is saying there's still something that needs to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. wow. This fulfillment has to come through my afflictions. Paul says I'm still I still have a job to do. The church has not yet come to its culminating point. 
And there are many things that still has to transpire before it all comes to this culmination. And so, and I think that's what's being illustrated in Hebrews 11, 39 and 40 as well, that there is a point in time in which it's all going to come to this final culminating point in which the old covenant is now judged. It's put away the resurrection. Now it comes to fruition where amen everywhere are amenable to it being in Christ or outside of Christ dead or alive. And uh, that was yet in Paul's future. And he said, I still have things that have to be fulfilled in my journey in order for everything regarding the church to come to fruition. And I think that's just a beautiful uh, passage illustrating that, you know, Christ, and I'm, I'm not demeaning Christ at all by saying this, but the body of Christ had things to fulfill in addition to that which Christ had accomplished in his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. The broken body at this time still had to go through this great tribulation and all these things it had to face, all that had to be fulfilled. And so it's a part of this beautiful scheme of God that he, that we have in place to show us that it did come to its culmination and we have trust and faith that it is eternal. And, um, that's where my mind goes when, when that passage is brought up many times. Amen. Amen. Well said. Vicki, did that respond well to your question? <laughs> I, it's almost the same, but mine probably is more simple. Okay. Mm -hmm. in, in those two verses, God promised the old covenant to be resurrected. But right. it takes several thousands of years. But God is a God that promised and he will not lie. Amen. So this resurrection will come to fruition until the temple is destroyed, the old covenant is destroyed, mm -hmm. the new covenant come into, into reality. And... Uh, and the church is consummated, and this all happened in 70 AD. I thought this mm -hmm. verse, these two verses are just gold mines. I agree. Amen. Amen. You, you know, this reminds me of a teaching. William Bell has a teaching that he calls the uh, the jewels of the resurrection, you know, the facets of the resurrection, because there's so many different morsels of truth that lead in if this was the hope of israel let's face it there's so many inroads that could be talked about there's so much you know what was the change of the living what was the the resurrection of the dead the the uh the awakening of those that were asleep you know there's uh the you know and then again i think what we're saying here we're all highlighting different morsels of truth uh for yes. example uh what i thought about when vicky was talking i thought about when steve was talking was what jesus says in matthew 5 about the jots and tittles and i know that was brought up during the debate with uh, Steve Whitsett, where what we're saying as full preterists is essentially that there were details of the old covenant, the promise of judgment, the promise and the, uh, you know, for some, it wasn't a pro Well, it was a promise altogether, whether you, you know, it was eternally eternal condemnation or uh, eternal life. Uh, but either way, a promise from God that, you know, that he would bring forth resurrection to yes, the living, to the dead, to, you know, everybody, that was the goal, the resurrection that it would be provided. So what Vicky's pointing out in Hebrews 11, obviously it goes on a long list there of the old covenant dead. What Steve's pointing out is that that's the goal of the church in the first century as they're going about preaching the gospel, suffering in, you know, in their going about preaching the gospel, they were filling up the measures of you know, of the suffering. So that in this period of time, the jots and tittles would be fulfilled. The old covenant would be fulfilled. And that's why Christ said, and I appreciate that, Steve, you brought this up in your debate, uh, verse 20, uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 22, because these are the days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. So again, that's what we're saying here is that the resurrection was that culminating event that you know would happen at the shattering of the power of the holy people that would resurrect the dead and cause them to have this life. This would that would be that, as Steve rightly said, that would be that culminating event, and that would include, of course, the old covenant dead that were mentioned in Hebrews chapter eleven. Uh, so uh, you know this beautiful event that would happen at the shattering of the power of the holy people. So uh, for those of us that obviously studied through this, it becomes so clear. 
uh, and then to talk about the different morsels of truth that can come out of the resurrection, which I think Vicky's leading in on, uh, is obviously can, is an exhaustive study. That being said, uh, I'm actually looking to develop a study uh, going through what we call resurrection texts. So uh, I want to encourage everyone to keep tuning in to our program, and we'll be uh, developing a night. We'll probably do it somewhere on like a Tuesday or a Thursday night. Uh, we'll come become live on social media and uh, go through these resurrection texts. And Steve, I say that because you're more than welcome to join with us, of course, uh, to speak into the study or to even just be a part of that study. And uh, Vicki, I want to thank you for your questions, comments this morning. We're up against the time. So I'm going to go ahead and start bringing our program to a close. We are. Thank you for being here, Zach, Richard. I want to thank you, of course, the online community. I want to thank all of you, Steve. Thank you for you know being here this morning. Uh, before I close us out, I just want to give you a moment to share any last thoughts, and uh, then I'll share some last thoughts myself and close us in prayer. Okay, I don't want to be uh, long-winded here, but I want to touch again real quick on the difference between reading and comprehension. My oldest daughter, Amanda, uh, was born with, uh, she'd come loose from her mother's placenta, and she was born with no blood. Um, when she came out of Rhonda's belly, she was like a white, wet dish rag, and the doctor said she would never live. Um, they flew her to the University of Michigan, where they said she will live, but she will always be severely mentally handicapped. And then at some point they said, well, she may not be severely mentally handicapped, but she'll always be behind. She'll never be equal with those on, of the same age. And this sort of plagued her until she got into high school. When she got into high school, that's when I became really seriously interested in Christianity. And my family and I, we would sit around the dinner table at night and we would read the Bible. And I found something, uh, Michael, that I think is extremely important. And that is Amanda had a comprehension problem. She was born with this physical uh, handicap, if I can say it that way. And she had a hard time comprehending things. But when we started uh, studying the Bible together as a family, I would have her read a passage. And then I would ask her insight, what do you think that's saying? And then if she gave an answer that contradicted another Bible passage, I would say, that's not correct. Can you tell me why that's not correct? And I'm, it forced her to start comprehending things from a different perspective. Now, by the time she graduated high school, and I owe this all to the Bible by, and proper hermeneutics of Bible study, she graduated the top of her class. She even went on to college and got several degrees, and you would have never known she was born with that handicap, and I attribute it to proper hermeneutical comprehension of the scripture. I made her reason through it to a level, to a degree where it harmonized, it did not contradict, and it made perfect sense, and we could find together objective truths, and that really developed her comprehension. Now, for those of you who are reading the Bible, may I suggest this hermeneutic, if I can, this will serve you well to harmonize things, to question everything, to find other passages and when you find a passage that's contradicting, you know you're wrong in one of your understanding of the passages, maybe both. And our, I, the way we can do this is to try to comprehend it in a way where it all harmonizes perfectly. And that will help us in our comprehension level. Amen. Thank you for that. Absolutely. That's a beautiful uh, explanation there of the benefit of scripture. You know, the benefit and, and praise God for your daughter and that, that story. So thank you for sharing, Steve. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end us in a moment of prayer. I do want to let you know, uh, as I mentioned, I'm looking forward to developing a resurrection study. So that will build on top of this. I'll be mentioning a little bit of that in our blog. If you visit powerofpreterism.wordpress.com, I'm going to be cataloging this video as well as the debate, uh, the debate I did with Steve Whitsett, uh, maybe even that article that I mentioned that he wrote against me uh, in regards to the resurrection. And uh, we'll share all of that on a personal blog. So Steve, I'll be tagging you in that. So uh, hopefully everybody will benefit from the resources that we provide. Uh, tomorrow night, I just want to let everyone know, uh, we are going to have Jonathan Buttry joining with us. Jonathan is going to be talking about the conference that we recently had in Tennessee in regards to Rethinking the Resurrection. If you're looking on the screen, of course, there's our graphic, uh, Rethinking the Resurrection. Jonathan Buttry is going to join us tomorrow night, 7 p.m. You can be a part of our discussion by Zooming in or calling in, or of course, watching on Facebook Live. Uh, they will not be streaming through YouTube, but it will be streaming through Facebook Live. And of course, another part of tomorrow evening will be uh, our Flashback Friday. Uh, what we call it is Flashback Friday, Flash Forward Friday. We provide 
resources for your benefit, and then also, of course, announcements for your benefit, uh, looking forward to some of the conferences and debates and details that we have in the future, uh, not just provided to you through the Power of Preterism Network, but also through the entire preterist community. Uh, thank you again, Steve, for being here this morning. If you don't mind, I'm just going to close us out, and I thank you for uh, all of you for tuning in. Uh, mighty God, we do thank you for the opportunity to fellowship around your word and your name this morning, Lord. We thank you for the truth that you continue to breathe into this world, into our lives. We thank you, Lord, for Steve Baisden. We thank you for his efforts uh, in regards to uh, continuing the, the, the power of preterism, uh, the truth of fulfilled Bible prophecy. And may you bless him, bless his family, bless his congregation, and continue to lead all of us, Lord, to honestly handle the word of God, to study to show ourselves approved, or as we often say here, seek, search, study, and prove the things of God. Thank you, Lord. We lift up our time as worship to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace Thank and you, God Mike. bless. Y'all have a good day. Thanks again. Thank you.